you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> So does everyone remember the Ultrasound Leadership Academy we mentioned to you earlier this year? If not, we'll refresh your memory. It's a 12-month, intense, premium program to train leaders in point-of-care ultrasound. We offer online, mobile content divided up into 5-10 to 10 minute, easily digestible, bite-sized segments, journal articles, weekly Google Hangouts with us to discuss issues and go over scans, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Then we meet in person at the Castle, in Sweden, in Canada, in Australia, or wherever we happen to be teaching live. We're about halfway through the inaugural class, and it's going awesome. We love it. We love doing the podcast, the apps, iBooks, and FOMED in general, but we wanted something more. Crave more of this one-on-one -on -one virtual interaction, where we could not only put education out there, but also dive deep, work through issues, help guide individuals to true ultrasound mastery, while also letting them learn from our past mistakes when it comes to things like ultrasound administration, teaching with others. And while it's going great, it's also changed dramatically in the first six months. We've been able to work with the first group who are incredible and adjust along the way to make this an even more remarkable and personalized experience. Yeah, it's about to get crazy. First off, we realized that having access to us was probably cool, but what if we got even better, more smarter people than us to join, and niche experts for the fellows to hang out with based on whatever particular issues they were having. Want to talk blocks? Cool, stone. Echo? Awesome, Malin. And I'm always here for, uh, I mean, you know, other stuff. Or maybe you want to talk about the lung. How about the lung queen? That's right, the one that wrote the book, the one that did the studies, the justifiably world-famous Vicki Noble. Or how about Lale from Sona Spot? You know her brilliance from her blog, from EM Crit, from here on the podcast, from Castle Fest, and wherever you may have had the extreme pleasure of learning from her. Or Critical Care Ultrasound. What about At Critical Care Now, the Haney Malamad? Guy is wicked smart. EM board certified, IM board certified, critical care fellowship trained, passed the ECHO boards, and loves to teach. Was U of Maryland Instructor of the Year last year. We heard he's so awesome he even got invited to teach at Castlefest. Or Rob Arntfield, amazing critical care guy. If you haven't met him or learned from him, then you haven't lived. Want to get deep into TEE or valvular assessment? He can get you there. Or what if you want to talk ECHO guided life support? And you can also understand their accent. Then Jean Francois and Maxime are here for you at your call. Seriously, we think it's pretty cool to have two Echo Ultrasound Masters who you can hang out with in French if you want. And speaking of speaking, Vicky is seriously fluent in Mandarin. I'm not kidding. She studied there for an extended period of time and has a minor or something like that in it. And I'm pretty conversant myself in Appalachian, I have to say, with being my native tongue and all. <laughs> or maybe you want to talk about MSK. Fractures, tendons, ligaments, injections, aspirations. We got the guy on board who we all go to with MSK questions. Emergency Ultrasound Director. Fellowship trained in sports medicine. Fellowship trained in looking like Val Kilmer, the Iceman, Mark Goodman. Or do you work in the community and want a pure genius who also works in the community and knows what it's like to work full-time in this real world I keep hearing about? Then we've got your man, Justin Cook. Remember the Win podcast, the Oblique Subclavian? I've been leaning on him since we were residents together and don't plan on stopping anytime soon. And then there's Casey Parker from the Broom Docs blog and podcast. He does things that only rural docs have the cojones to do with ultrasound. Or do you like to scan little adults? If so, Andy Slos from the Pim ED podcast, who is Pete's EM fellowship trained and ultrasound ninja, is here for you. He has his RDMS and is more into Pete's bits at Echo than anyone I know. But, you know, we apologize that so far we've only been able to take a fraction of the applicants. One of the things we love most about adding all these extra professors is that it will allow us to expand and accommodate more fellows and offer more scholarships to resource-limited physicians. The Hangouts will also be more personalized to meet your needs. So each week when you hang out, you decide who you want to meet with based on what questions you have. Pretty awesome. Yeah, but still not quite as awesome as we wanted it. We can give you the content and the experts to walk you through it. But unfortunately, we can't control the pathology that walks through your practice doors. What we can do, though, is simulate. So we're sending every fellow the Sonosim simulator. This thing is pretty awesome and teaches not only hand movements and the tactile experience of scanning, but it also has pathology cases you can work through at home, on your own time, when you're going through the content. It's a total simulation package worth over $10,000. The only way we could make this program any more incredibly awesome I think it's if we actually sent you your own machine to practice on yourself and family at home. Whoa, personal ultrasound machine. Sounds pretty cool. Why don't we do that? I'd be into that. Okay, decision made. 
We're also going to send every fellow their own pocket ultrasound machine to use for the entire length of the academy. There you have it. We're dedicated to making this thing a ridiculously awesome experience. We want you to have everything you need to become an ultrasound master. And we've got other ideas to incorporate as well, but we're just waiting on the actual technology to catch up. For example, as soon as we get the kinks worked out of teleportation, come right back here for another update. Uh, Probably months away, though. In the meantime, we can't wait to meet you and work with you in a more personal way than the podcast. Join us for this crazy ride. Ride? Should we say experience? I'd prefer extravaganza or maybe hoot nanny. (laughs) (laughs) What about extravaventure nanny? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, here we go. Back to the basics. We're going to start off basically with the most basic of basics. Mike Stone on manipulating the probe. He's going to show you how to slide, rock, and tilt your way to a beautiful image. In my opinion, the importance of this skill is vastly underestimated. Whether we're teaching people in person or virtually with Ultrasound Leadership Academy, which we just told you about, a fair amount of time is spent on this. And no one manipulates the pro better than Mike Stone. The first time I saw him do this, I was in awe. He's extremely manipulative and has a knack for both doing it and explaining it. Frequently during the weekly hangouts with fellows, we find ourselves demonstrating different maneuvers with our iPhones, showing how to get different or better views based on their images they've recorded. But when Stone does it, it's amazing. It's like watching art happen. Be prepared to be blown away. Let's get some nomenclature down, let's get you oriented, and let's start working on your basic base. Next week, we're going to start focusing on physics. And over the next several weeks, we're going to get you a super solid base to start piling on all the advanced stuff we've been teaching you. So here it is, Mike Stone, manipulating and talking about manipulating the probe. One of the core transducer manipulation techniques is sliding. And in this case, we're going to use an echo simulator and a parasternal long axis view to illustrate this manipulation of the transducer. And... We are placing the transducer just to the left of the patient, or in this case, the simulator's sternum. The directional indicator is oriented towards the patient's right shoulder in a traditional echocardiographic setting on the machine where the directional indicator is oriented towards the screen right. Now, when you go to obtain a parasternal long axis view and place the transducer just to the left of the sternum around the fourth or fifth intercostal space, you'll often obtain air artifact as we're seeing here these horizontal bright lines that are reverberation artifact between the transducer and the lung and these are known as a lines as you'll recall from lung ultrasound technique what happens when you're visualizing a lines is that you're just too cephalad typically you're too close to the patient's head not close enough to the feet and you have air interposed between the chest wall and the heart so in this case sliding the transducer down towards the patient's feet while maintaining the other orientation aspects of the transducer, not rotating it or tilting it as we'll cover shortly, this will be an appropriate maneuver to improve your view. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. As we obtain this air artifact view, we simply slide or move the transducer down towards the patient's feet and obtain a window where we're able to visualize the heart. Sliding it back up, air artifact again, back down is an appropriate window for obtaining a view of the parasternal long axis. So this is sliding, one of the core transducer manipulation techniques, and this is a common clinical scenario where you'll need to slide the transducer to improve your view. Another core transducer manipulation technique is rotating. And in this case, we're going to stick with the parasternal long axis view. We have the directional indicator oriented slightly cephalad to where the patient's shoulder would be. And if we look on the ultrasound screen, we're getting a foreshortened view of the left ventricle. We can see the left atrium nicely, the mitral valve, the septum, and the posterior wall. But if we take a look at the actual LV chamber, it's much shorter than we expect it to be. And this is because we're obtaining a tangential view of the left ventricle. And when a chamber appears too short, or is otherwise twisted or oblique in your opinion when you're viewing it, rotating the transducer should be the first transducer manipulation technique that you attempt. So we'll take a look at what this looks like. And as the transducer is rotated, we're able to get a better view of the LV chamber. Rotating back, it's short again. Rotating again, we're seeing a better view of the chamber. So here's a foreshortened view And simply by rotating the transducer, we're able to obtain a true view of the LV cavity, keeping the other structures, left atrium, 
proximal aorta, mitral valve, pericardium, descending thoracic aorta, those are all still in view. So rotating the transducer is a key manipulation technique when chambers appear shortened and not manipulating the probe in any other way will allow you to maintain your window of the heart while rotating to an appropriate axis. Awesome stuff so far, Stone. This is really good. I just want to make a quick point uh, about cardiac ultrasound here. One way we can tell when we're foreshortening the left ventricle is that we actually see the apex of the left ventricle sort of moving in and out between systole and diastole. You should never actually see the apex move. When you're looking at the true apex of the left ventricle, it should stay stuck to the pericardium, basically. It shouldn't look like it's actually coming in. You don't actually get significant shortening of the left ventricle during, uh, during systole, the base of the heart goes down towards the apex, not the apex coming up towards the base. And you could see in Mike's video when he's got the foreshortened ventricle, it actually looks like the apex is moving towards the base. That is a great hint that you're foreshortening the ventricle, and you either need to twist your probe if you're in the personal long axis, or you need to make sure that you're actually at the apex if you're at the apical four-chamber window. The next transducer manipulation technique we'll cover is known as tilting, and we're sticking with the parasternal long axis view. Oftentimes when providers attempt this view, they will obtain an initial view that looks somewhat like this, where we're actually looking at right ventricle, tricuspid valve, and right atrium. And in this case, the imaging plane is angled too closely to the patient's feet, and we're looking at the inferior portion of the heart or the caudal portion of the heart. And to correct this, we have a nice window where we're able to see the RV free wall, and we know we're visualizing the heart nicely, but all we need to do is bring the imaging plane a little bit closer towards the patient's head. And to do that, we manipulate the transducer in a tilting motion. So we'll take a look at that. We're simply keeping probe contact, but tilting the transducer towards the head obtains a parasternal long axis view. And then tilting back, we're seeing the right ventricle. Tilting back again, we're able to visualize the parasternal long axis view. And here we're seeing the LV, mitral valve, aortic valve, proximal aorta, aortic root, left atrium, descending thoracic aorta, and the coronary sinus here. So this is a core manipulation technique known as tilting and is one of the four basic transducer manipulations. And wrapping up our core transducer manipulation techniques, we'll turn to rocking. And in this case, we're looking at an apical four-chamber window, and the transducer is positioned near the patient's point of maximal impulse. And this is a common view that I see when trainees are attempting to get an apical four-chamber. We're actually nicely seeing the LV cavity here. We're seeing the left atrium the right atrium, some of the right ventricle, but in general, the heart has an oblique orientation as opposed to a vertical orientation. So if we want to fix that, the corrective measure in this case is to rock the transducer. And in this case, you're essentially tilting the transducer, but instead of tilting it along the axis we uh, did for the tilting manipulation technique on the last example, we're tilting it along its long axis. So we'll take a look at what this looks like. From this view, simply tilting the transducer handle down towards the bed orients our heart into a vertical axis. So here we're upright, and then we're going to simply rock the transducer along its imaging plane and obtain a better angle. So again, rocking the transducer here gets us that vertical orientation of the heart that we're looking for in an apical four-chamber view. And this is the last of the core transducer manipulation techniques. So in summary, this is sliding the transducer keeping the orientation the same and simply moving it on the chest wall. This is rotating the transducer, again keeping the orientation and angle of the transducer the same, but simply twisting it on the chest wall. This is tilting the transducer, maintaining the rotation and position on the chest wall, but angling it in the short axis of the transducer. And this is rocking the transducer, maintaining its rotation and position on the chest wall, but angling it along its long axis or along the imaging plane. Check, check, check. Thanks, Stone. That was great stuff. So just to summarize, the main probe manipulations as you describe them are, one, sliding, or keeping the same orientation, but moving the probe on the skin so that you see the image through a new window. 
Two, rotating, or keeping the angle and orientation of the probe the same, just twisting it. Three, tilting, or manipulating the probe so that it's in the same position, but now you're angling along its short axis. And finally, four, rocking, where you keep the probe in the same position, just like tilting, except this time we're going to angle the probe along the long axis, which is the imaging plane itself. I think I can handle that. Uh, but you know what? I might need to imagine you doing these dance moves in order to really get this probe manipulation vocabulary down. In fact, I think that would be great homework for our listeners. Here's what I want you to do, guys. I want you to go home, and I want you to practice these probe manipulation techniques. But when you do it, I want you to imagine Dr. Stone breakdancing these moves, sliding, rotating, tilting, and rocking, while you're actually practicing these probe manipulations. All right, everyone, let's get started. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs. Let us know how you feel about it.